Welcome to Sausage on a Fork, a podcast dedicated to the UK's longest running children's drama programme, Grange Hill. My name's Neil, and in each episode, I'll interview a former cast member about their life before, during, and after their time on the programme. Okay, welcome to the next episode of Sausage on a Fork. I am very pleased to say that for this episode, I've been joined by none other than Gary Hales, who played Nigel Flavin. Gary, welcome to Sausage on a Fork. Thank you. Okay, Gary, uh, I'll start with the first question that I always ask everyone, and that is, how did you get into acting? How did acting start for you? Uh, I, I, I was always kind of interested in it from when I was very, very young. Uh-huh. And uh, I, I went to a normal school, regular kind of secondary, primary, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And at my primary school, uh, a new teacher came along and she was into drama and she decided that our small primary school should put on a Christmas play. Um, and it was actually the Wizard of Oz. Uh-huh. Uh, and I, I kind of was interested in wanting to get involved and I ended up being cast as the Scarecrow. All right. And at the end of it, she she suggested to a couple of us that we might get involved with the thing called the Anna Sher Children's Theatre, uh-huh. which was in Islington, which many other cast members of Grange Hill came from and, and attended. And I put my name down, joined that, I loved it. Um, within a very, very short space of time of being there, I, I was being auditioned for stuff, and then I got a, a role for a, a BBC uh, production of Pinocchio, one of those kind of four or five part series that oh, they used to do on Sunday evenings when I was a kid. I was like 11 or something at the time. And, and that that just, you know, continued from there. It was, I didn't think that, you know, coming from a kind of working class background and all of that stuff that uh-huh. you, I didn't think that was an option or, or something that was open to me. Yeah. Uh, and it, I, I guess there's an, an amount of luck involved and, and I'm very grateful to my drama teacher who kind of got me involved in that way back then. And I, I guess it changed my life. Yeah. So you just mentioned there about getting getting the part in, in Pinocchio and stuff. Because you obviously you have you had a few other bits as well. I've been looking and there was you know, there was a thing called Born and Bred and Nobody's Hero and which yeah, is I a... mean I, I did a lot of stuff as a kid. I was I was really lucky. Yeah. Um, Born and Bred um was a kind of sitcom thing that I, I took over from someone called Christian Bullock. Right. It was actually Jeremy Bullock's son. Jeremy if anything. Oh, yeah. Stuff, yeah. Uh, Boba Jeremy Fett. Bullock's yeah. son was was in a sitcom, but he was doing exams or something, right. so he couldn't do the second season. So uh, they recast it, and I got lucky enough to do it. Um, and that was working with people like Max Wall for those that remember right. him. And the wow. Peacock was in it, and Joan Sim. It was amazing. I was like twelve or something, looking at all these legends, and I mean real legends. And I, yeah. I had such a um, <laughs> nobody's here. I was a great kids show that's never been repeated ever since. Right. It was- First aired. I don't know why, but it was a very kind of edgy show. And I remember part of it was uh, involved in setting a house on fire. Uh, right. my kid's not, not necessarily a good guy. Um, and, he, you know, he ended up setting a house on fire. And I remember watching that to this day as they did it three, three separate times. We set fire to a, a living room. It was quite bizarre. And they had to redecorate it in between everyone. Wow. <laughs> right. Um, the things you see when you're a kid. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, and then there was also Witches in the Grinny Gog. Is that right as well? You were in that, that one? That was, yeah, that was just a small, um, I was like 16 or 17 or something, I guess. Must have been 17 because I was driving. Um, and that's where I met Adam Woodyard, who played Ian in East right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, he was he was doing that, and I, I can't remember what I did in the show itself. It was... Uh, <laughs> wasn't a huge part, but it was fun. And that uh, I, that's how we, when I very first met Ian. Uh, Adam. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so then so then how did Grange Hill come about? Um I I did the the first part of Grange Hill, I, I, I remember watching the very first episode when it very first came out, like yeah. forever ago. Um I, and loving it. And I just around just about the same time I started at the Anna Shirt Yeah. Um and I loved it. I thought it was a fantastic show, and I'd always wanted to be in it. And I'd auditioned for it a couple of times. Um, uh, it just didn't work out for whatever reason. Who knows? Uh-huh. Uh, and then I left school. Uh, and whilst at school, I was forever getting in trouble for not wearing school uniform. I was right. terrible. 
was into the whole rock and roll and the rockabilly scene, and I'd, I'd be like the roll up jeans, the earring, getting in grief because of that. <laughs> uh, never wear like you know black trousers, <laughs> jeans. That's what I used to wear. Uh, and then I left school and got a job wearing school uniform, which was kind of bizarre. <laughs> um, I I I done a, a very small bit in season six where I did like a day's filming on it. Uh, and I knew Mark Savage very well. Right. We were both involved in, we both used to go to the same sort of kind of rock and roll clubs and we got to uh-huh. know each other really well. And I did a day's film and we were like hanging out and having fun. Uh, and then Mark was just so good at what he did. Yeah. Um, the, the BBC painted themselves into a corner and they had to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, because he became just too controversial. Uh, and it's a shame because the gripper character was pretty spot on yeah. in my mind. And he played it really well. Yeah. And, you know, the guys that were with him, you know, the whole thing, I always thought it was written really well. For, c- considering the time uh, it was on TV, uh-huh. they tempered it, I thought, really nicely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, real school bullies at the time were really considerably more violent and aggressive than the Mark portrayed Gripper as because he had to do it in, in a certain way. <laughs> anyway, how... Unfortunately, Gripper had to be expelled or or whatever it was they did got, yeah. got from the school, uh, and they needed someone to replace him. Yeah, and I think very smartly they chose two people to replace him. Yeah, so that it wasn't like a replacement; it was something completely different. Yeah, they need um, they needed someone to fill that void, didn't they? They needed yeah. someone to fill that um, void. Yeah. And Mark had left such a huge hole, it took two of us to do it. Right. Um, myself and Gary Love were cast, and we were kind of like, <laughs> I was kind of laughing, so we were like the Laurel and Hardy of the school <laughs> bullies. <laughs> kind of like, we were school bullies, but we kind of weren't, and we were kind of like a, a little bit Robin Hoodish and a little bit, but we were not really bad. Not, not, not in the way Mark had been. Yeah. Um, and it was great fun to do. And I'd met Kenny McBain a um, year earlier. Um, and, I, it, you know, he'd, he'd kind of, uh, we'd kind of talked and he was a really lovely man. Anyone who met Kenny, I'm sure would say the same. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't know, it just kind of evolved. I know they, they called me in for an audition with about 10 or 15 of us at, at the Anna Shirt. Uh, children's theatre one afternoon um, and yeah it just I don't know it just worked out and yeah I was offered the role and I remember at the time um, because be, you know as I'm sure many other people have told you acting is not and there are a lot of you spend a lot of time out of work uh-huh. um, and I just I just been kind of I don't want to use the word conned but convinced is probably a better word <laughs> to get a proper job yeah. And I'd got a proper job as a postman. Right. And I absolutely, I never knew there were two, four rocks in the day. <laughs> um, right. That was just completely wrong, all kinds of wrong, getting up at four o'clock in the morning. In fact, generally, I did know there were two, four o'clock, but I thought it was when you came in, not when you went out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just really, really didn't enjoy the job. It wasn't for me. Uh, it just wasn't. It didn't suit my lifestyle. Right. But, you know, I was doing the thing that I said I would do and try and, you know, be the sensible one. And, of course, I then got off a going show after, after being a postman for, a, I think, seven weeks or something I lasted. <clears throat> and I remember telling my mum and dad, it's great, you know, I've got this great job, and I'm going to quit the post office. And I remember having this lecture you would give about how I'm not taking life seriously and what about my pension and da 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 yeah. and all the kind of stuff parents tell you, yeah. which is but when you're 17, you really don't care about very much. Yeah. Um, you know, pensions, I don't really think about pensions now, and I'm considerably <laughs> older. I didn't think about pensions when I was 17. Um, and I, I just, against their better wishes, I, you know, I went in the next day, handed my note, and we started filming about well, maybe a month later or something, a couple of weeks later, I don't even remember. What I do remember, which always makes me laugh, because uh, Kenny McBain makes it for one reason or another <clears throat> and this is kind of a claim to fame 
although it's never ever mentioned, but it is true. Uh, I was the first guy at Grange Hill ha- uh, character to have an earring. Wow. And it had through the net because I had an earring. I still, oh, it's not in at the moment. <laughs> um, I, have, uh, I had an earring um, and uh, I don't know, nobody had told me to take it out, so I didn't. And, it, it, you know, if you have your ear pierced, it's not something you're aware of particularly. It's not like it's right yeah. in front of you. So you just, and they'd shot some stuff. Uh, and by the time they'd shot it, it's like it, well, it was it. So it, it stayed. And I remember Ken, uh, Kenny coming up and made a joke about how I'd be the forget away with that. After they'd had storylines about people not wearing jewelry at Grange Hill and yeah. stuff like this. And somehow or another, I just seemed to get away with it. But it, I, in, in, in some respects, it kind of added to my character because he was still the one that yeah. just wasn't the same as everybody else. Yeah. And, and probably just too thick to to take it out. <laughs> so, you know, we've mentioned that, you know, Jimmy and Nigel, who was played by uh, yourself and, and Gary Love, were brought in to, to fill the void sort of thing for, for Gripper and, and his henchmen. But they were very, very different types of bullies, weren't they? You know, they, were, they, seemed, they were, seemed to be more intelligent. They spoke more articulately. And they were more about making yeah. making money than and, and being a little bit more manipulative than than aggressive and and and, and just being thuggish. I think, you know, um, I guess yeah. It, I claim that my character was a little bit more intelligent. <laughs> I don't think he was. He was he was this kind of henchman and kind of st- stooge, I guess, to yeah. some degree. Um, uh, but Jimmy, yeah, he was, he was smarter. He was, yeah. you know, he was sharply dressed. He was a little smoother and a little kind of. It, it was it was very different, and and I think that was a really smart move because uh-huh. if you'd have tried to get somebody else to mimic what Mark had done, yeah, it just wouldn't work. And and, and if you're going to do that, you shouldn't have gone because he was doing it perfectly good, yeah, uh, as he was. Um, and you know, testament to that is, you know, people still talk about Gripper. Yeah, what are we like knit. Nearly 40 yeah. years on, or whatever it is, years on, people remember Mark and Gripper. And, you know, if I ever have to explain, you know, people will sometimes find out I've been in Grange Hill for one reason or another. And then they'll always go, Oh, who are you? And I'm like, Yeah, I'm the guy that took over after Gripper. And they're like, Oh, yeah, I'm the, yeah, I, yeah. I had big hair. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. <laughs> um, but it's like, but Mark, instantly they remember it because yeah. it was, it was, he, he, he played it really well. It was pretty controversial at the time, you know, dealing. Phil Redmond's, you know, as a guy who's really got his finger on the pulse, always has, uh, always has had, you know, we're going out way back in the day, um, Brookside, um, ton, tons of stuff. Yeah. He, he really, he really kind of has an, an instinct for people and understands how things work yeah. and creates stuff. I, and facilitates the the creating of stuff yeah. by setting up these situations like Granger Brooks and all the rest. That just Brookside was for me. Brookside was quite entertaining because it was very reflective of real life, but it it, it kept the humour of real life as well, yeah. which Grange Hill did. Yeah, and I think that's what's missing from an awful lot of TV now is because and as a scouser, you'd be a prime example of this, and you see this all the time. Any scouser I ever know, no matter how bad it is, at the end of it, they still make a joke. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. it's a way of, it's a, it's a way of, uh, and so much stuff that's on TV now for me misses that. It misses yeah. that right touch that people somehow, somehow have or use to deal and address situation. Yeah. And, you know, I think it was very much yeah. like that. You know, we don't, we, I, you know, I was a part of it. I, don't, I can't claim we, but Grange Hill dealt with some serious stuff. Yeah. You know, all the stuff they did about the drugs and all that. Did some really serious stuff. Uh-huh. But in those very same episodes, we'll have some light moments. Yeah, but definitely. With you and, and, and give it all balance. Make it all very realistic and very real. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So oh, I'm sounding proper pretentious. <laughs> so you, you mentioned there about, about Gary Love. Obviously, you, you you worked obviously really closely with, with Gary. Were you were you close to him off, off camera as well? Oh, we hung out a bit. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen Gary a couple of times since. 
Uh, he went off to do soldier, soldier. I went off yeah. to do other stuff. Um, we both, bizarre coincidence, we both left Green We only did one season, season yeah. seven, um, because we were fifth years at the time and our uh-huh. characters would have stayed on. It just wouldn't have happened. But we both left Grange Hill and went on to acting jobs that involved us wearing roller skates, as bizarre as that. <laughs> Harry was in the very first uh, cast of uh, Starlight Express. Wow, right. I went off and did a, 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 a drama with a, a very famous director who I worked with a couple of times called Alan Clark, uh-huh. who's probably most famous for scum, stuff like that. And he did a thing called Stars of the Roller Skate Disco. And I remember leaving Grange Hill and then having to go away. And just bizarrely, both of us went away. Yeah. And had to, we had to go away and spend a month learning separately, but learning how to ride roller skates. It was it was really surreal. Yeah. I mean, the thing for me about when when you and, and, and Gary both started was Gary Love, was, he was fairly well known already, wasn't he? He, he, you know, he he was. I, I for me as a kid, he was instantly recognisable because he'd done loads of adverts and stuff. I thought he did the Kentucky Fried Chicken. Yeah, that was. My it. God, I've not even thought of that in thirty-five years. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I just yeah, remember he... thinking, oh, that's him, that's that fella, that's that lad, you know. Um, and I, I also yeah, I remember that. I always thought that was quite a. I don't know whether it was you know a shoot move or whatever because people had recognised him because you were brought in as characters you'd never been in it before, but you were obviously supposed to be established pupils if you like yeah. you were supposed to be already there and i just thought that thinking about it now did he do that on purpose because he was recognizable and people you know what i mean it was it, it was one of them i just i just I, that's to that's it. something i can't answer yeah um, i i have no idea uh but i do remember the kentucky fried chicken ads. <laughs> yeah and i do remember being out with him before our green shield stuff had gone out on there somewhere and and somebody screaming about Kentucky Fried Chicken across <laughs> he's screaming across and saying something. Yeah. Um Gary was a nice guy. So I really like Gary a lot. Yeah. Um, and he's a good actor. I mean he went on and did did a lot of stuff and I believe he's directing and stuff now. All right, cool. Um, and if he watches this, I do not understand for a second why he hasn't cast me in one single <laughs> Gary. Just <laughs> sort it out, Gary. <laughs> So, because uh, I was I was looking and you know obviously you you mentioned already that you were in you were in one one series of it you weren't necessarily in a great deal of episodes I don't think you you, you know there was uh, uh, I think it was like nine, yeah 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 nine or something maybe something so, uh, like that. yeah because I, I was I was looking through because normally obviously when I've got someone who's been on a little bit longer we talk about favourite storylines or episodes and something so I was just looking through all of them. I was just looking through the episodes, and it it is every single one seems to be Jimmy and, and Nigel making money in some way, finding some way of, of, of making money. Obviously, you know, sponsored walks, the walks and chain and letter, and... yeah, the, the chain letter, the sponsored walks and stuff. But there was a there was one where uh, going back onto the sponsored walk, you were responsible for a very famous sort of Grange Hill joke, which was moving signs around and changing the directions on sound because he did that quite a bit in Grange Hill, usually for like the start of term and stuff. And I, I often... Uh, yeah, I remember doing that. We, we filmed it all. I live in North London. and right. did at the time as well. Still do. Um, and we filmed a lot of it around uh, Hampstead and Alexander Palace and Crouch End. Uh, right. It's all kind of North London areas. So it was really yeah. great for me. I drive to work. <laughs> Um, that whole kind of, because we were filming out in public, um, yeah. at, at the time the school was in Fulham on Graham Road, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was an, an actual old school. And then they later moved it to L Street. But uh, So we never got to film out in public very much. And when we did, it was always kind of fun and it would always attract a lot of, yeah. uh, <clears throat> attract a lot of attention. Um, and it was, it was a lot of fun, those episodes, doing the, the, the kind of, I think what was important about all the sponsor walk and all of that stuff was, the, you know, the, the motivation for the characters to do it was very serious. You know, they're going to yeah. beat this guy and Roly's going to earn this money and we're going to steal it, take it from him on all of this kind of stuff. But it was actually done in a way that was very, very comedic. And I, yeah. and I <laughs> very, you know, it goes back to the, the yes, we were kind of school bullies. We were kind of this, that and the other, but actually 
we were not in the same league as Mark. No. But, well, not Mark. <laughs> yeah. Not yeah, right. as I say, it was all about making the money, you know, trying to convince the lad that he thought was going to finish first, trying to convince him yeah. not to because they were running a book. But if then... I had to have a favourite episode, and I do, um, it would have to be the last one, the school disco. Yeah. Um, oh, I can't remember the guy, the, the school bully from the other school. Brookfield? Glucksall Remington. That was Glucksall Glucksall. Remington, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, was it Brookfield School? Brookdale. Where from? Brookdale. Brookdale. Brookdale yeah. School, and, and you know, turning him upside down and emptying his trousers. But that yeah. wasn't the fun bit. Fun all the way through and watching Jimmy work out what was going on. And da, yeah. da, da, da. But the fun part was it was also the very first time that they did the end credits differently. Yeah. And instead of, uh, instead of the regular credits, yeah. we were doing the schmoochy thing to, I think it was True by True, Spain. Yeah, Valley I mean, or, it's, a, it's a really iconic, it's a classic Clay Jill scene. That one. Oh, I, I just was so chuffed to be in that and watch yeah. and have the Ads Army style credits where it was like yeah. you had been watching. Yeah. And I'm dancing with, oh God, I can't remember a character's name. Annette. Annette. Yeah. Um, uh, and <laughs> the whole thing was just, it was just such a fun episode. And I guess in some ways that was made all the more fun because it was kind of like in the term because uh-huh. it was the last episode and that was the last bit we filmed. Yeah. And then they came did you were going to do this special bit at the end where this is so people were quite excited about it and I, it was a lot of fun and we used to film at um, white city uh yeah. at the, you know what then a uh, television center um and it was always fun when you were filming because you would do all the the lot the, all the exterior stuff at one studio at another point yeah and whenever we did the studio i think we we used to like wednesday and thursday or something like that uh, which would always coincide with Top of the Pops right. being filmed. So you'd be hanging out with like all the latest bands, you know, yeah. Simon Le Bon or, you know, Adam and or whoever it was, would all be kind of around. And it was this kind of, I remember being on a, a TV centre as like a, a huge round yeah. building and the corridors just kind of go in a big circle. And I remember being downstairs and having a, a dressing room downstairs. One of the episodes I was in, I came out of my dressing room and walked along. I can't remember who I was with, but I was with somebody else. And we found ourselves before we went up the escalators outside Cliff Richards' uh, <laughs> dressing room. And we stood there for a while while he practiced singing. And I gotta say, you could knock Cliff all you like, but wow, that was impressive. Yeah. You know, he was just warming up. And, and I remember at the time for you, oh, how cool is this? And I'm getting paid to. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I don't know where, because a, a couple of people are like, Lee Spark, Lee Spark, when he was on, mentioned seeing uh, Buster Blood Vessel and Lisa York said she'd seen K- Chrissy Boy from Madness as well. Like, yeah. uh, as I say, like for a kid, you know, being that age and seeing these people in the flesh must have just been amazing. Oh, it was cool as anything. Yeah. Absolutely. It was anything. It was a really, really good fun. Yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned there about, you know, the, the disco and you were dancing with Annette. My, my only thing with that is, a few episodes earlier, you'd nick their bike. And that was the other thing, like, <laughs> the lads Yeah, the lads but nick- you know what it's like? <laughs> you, you, see, you know, the, the bad guy's like, you say, he's nicking the bike. He wants the bike. He's, he's really, it's just a cry for attention. <laughs> <laughs> the thing for me, what, watching that as an adult as well, the whole stealing the bike thing, it didn't ring true to what, I thought anyway, Jimmy and Nigel were like, do you know what I mean? It didn't seem like, they were the types of lads Cry that would, for attention. That would have done. Nigel just had a big thing for, for and, and and you know that was you know he he he, he wasn't Shakespeare. He didn't have the likes <laughs> and all that. He had to get her attention somehow. And yeah. you know uh, the thing is, watch the last episode. Clearly, it worked. Yeah, I definitely, definitely. And the other thing I liked about that episode, you mentioned it already, was Jimmy and Nigel. They did have a bit of a change of heart, didn't they? Do you know what I mean? They did become sort of like the bouncers for the school and. You know, they were watching Gluck, so when they were making sure that he wasn't nicking the money. And at first, when when you watch it, I was thinking, is it because they want the money? But they genuinely didn't, did they? Do you know what I mean? They want no, it's, the- it's that age of thing. If you've got a group of friends, you can you can have a go at one of them. Yeah. But, but some from the outside can't. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. If, if they're in my group. You, you, you haven't earned the right to do that yet. Definitely. And I think it's that, it's your school. You, you know, it, it's amazing when you, 
I know some people that are in the army and stuff, or not now, but were. And it's like you'd have regiments kind of having aggression between two regiments. Well, right. But then, you know, so you'd have two army regiments who go, yeah, well, they're not as good as we're going. Da, 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 da. Then the Navy will come along and they go, hang on a minute, we're the army. Yeah. And they'll come together and they'll attack the common foe. Yeah. It, it, I think there's an element of that the Jimmy, you know, it was his school and yeah. his territory. And, you know, it's not done to be shown up. You know, if I can't look after my own school, that's my reputation out the window. Yeah. Da, da, da. So, you know, I think he was defending his honour, albeit, uh, you know, you, with the school, as it were. Yeah. Uh, or perhaps I just overthink these things. <laughs> no, I mean, no, no, that's, uh, that's fair enough. That's, that, is, that is what it comes across like. You know what I mean? That is definitely what it comes across like. Um, was there anyone, when you were on, the set that you enjoyed working with? Obviously, you know, you mentioned you were only in sort of eight or nine episodes. Was there anyone where you looked forward to working kind of, with? I, I kind of enjoyed working with everyone. Yeah. To be honest. And, and at the time, if there were squabbles, I wasn't aware of them. Right. I, you know, I knew a lot of people from... Um, and a shares, so yeah. I already knew them anyway. Uh, Gary and I were a little bit older, not a lot. We, were, um, we both had cars right. for a start. We, so, you know, we were 17, 18, or whatever it was. Uh-huh. Um, so I don't know if there were any, but we, I got on well with any, everyone. I, I loved, you know, I loved hanging out with the guys and having fun. You know, yeah. we'd, we'd go out occasionally and we did go out on, on in fact, as I recall, Mark came out with us. All right. Uh, last day, Mark uh-huh. Savage. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he came out with us, and we ended up in the West End somewhere. All of us having a crazy good time because Mark was in a couple of the episodes. With, yeah, yeah. You know, facing off against, um, you know, with the butcher's bike and the yeah, whole thing. yeah, yeah, the sponsors were yeah, <laughs> yeah, the all parts. Um, which again, I thought was really nice, and yeah. and because I knew Mark socially, and still, uh, you know, Mark and I still keep in touch a little bit. Um, it was kind of nice working with Mark uh, yeah. and, and and being with him and, and kind of having a bit of a giggle and, and stuff. And, and I think, I don't know, I, again, I think it was the right thing for the show to do. Yeah. Gripper was such a, to just kind of toss him out and, and whatever, it's, it's, yeah. it's wrong. Uh, yeah. And to just kind of feature him a little bit like that was great. And, and I hope, you know, I know that there's all sorts of talk about things that they're going to do moving forward and that, Grange Hill's going to be a film or a new series or this or whatever. Yeah. Whatever it is, I hope they include him. Right. Because he was, you know, I, if I think of Grange Hill, I think of Mark, well, Gripper, uh, Lee McDonald. Yeah. Uh, Zan, um, you know, the, and, in fact, I'd say Tucker, I guess. Yeah. Uh, it was, you know, when I was very first watching it um, and that kind of crowd. But Mark definitely is up there with those guys. Yeah. He, is you know a big part of Grange Hill history. Yeah, definitely. And you know, I I I hope that if they do move forward with something, that they they get him involved because they should. Yeah, uh, I think. I always thought it'd be good to see a where is he now gripper kind of thing. Yeah, you know, how yeah. did that work out for him? Yeah, because there was a a, um, a few years back there was one of these polls, you know, like the greatest TV villains ever. And Gripper was something like number six. No, it wasn't. It no wasn't, way. It wasn't children's TV villains. It was like you know, it was covering <laughs> all of oh, television. That's so Gripper, cool. he was so he was right up there, like yeah, he was something like you know number six or something like that. Which you know is a testament to Mark. It's a testament to Phil Redmond and you know anyone else yeah. who, who's involved as well. So the thing is, it was the early eighties, right? Yeah. So you look. Mark was filming, you know, the early eighties. You know, it, things were not as kind of free as they are now when television is concerned. No, you know, it's censorship and uh, I can't remember the woman's name now, the, the crazy lady that used to cancel everything. Uh, Mary Whitehouse. <laughs> Mary Whitehouse. Uh, you know, you had all that going on and television was very sanitised. Um, and it, uh, I just, they kept it very real. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's that famous, is it the Young One sketch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Which is fairly accurate. Yeah. But in fairness to the show, they did used to, with the exception of maybe the foul language, you know, it wasn't yeah. so far away from the truth, you know, yeah. and, and what was going on. And that's, that Mark and Lee both had, you know, uh, responsible for that. Yeah, you know, definitely. 
boxing, which was, you know, pretty. You know, I remember it back in the day and and just, it was on the news, it was on everything. Yeah. Uh, Because it was a a real, it was really brave of a a TV show, but not just a TV show, a children's TV show. To deal with such uh, a controversial and serious subject and deal with it very sensitively, take one of their lead characters and, and, and kind of flip that around. Yeah. And, and that's that's how it works in real life. I mean, I had a friend many, many years ago who ended up sadly not, not lasting through drugs, right. who had everything going for him, was like top of this and top of that, mm-hmm. but involved in drugs and his life just bottomed out. You know, just unfortunately, no matter what his folks tried to do, they, they couldn't yeah. make a difference. So to actually put that on a show, mm-hmm. Uh, and and get people talking about it because people didn't then you know no. I, there was an awful lot schools didn't talk about stuff like that you know? no. they just didn't um, I thought it was very very brave of, of I guess the BBC as well um, you know it, uh, in some ways and I'm not dissing anybody who who works in TV today but people had to be a little bit more creative in the way in which they presented things because. The restrictions meant that they couldn't just put it out there. Yeah. So they had to find other ways around to make things work. And Grain Chill was certainly for a show that went out in, you know, children's TV slots, you know, midweek after school. Yeah. They dealt with some stuff that was pretty out there. Yeah, definitely. So for for that time. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure people watch it now and go, wow, that's kind of tame. But you know, times were different then as well. Things uh-huh. were not. No, no, that's a uh, no, that, that that that's cool. So you've mentioned already that you know you were only there for one series. Was going back ever discussed, or was that just it, just from the? It was never discussed. Um, n- well, not with us. Um, right. I think that was always their intention. Uh-huh. And you know, if if I'm honest, I don't. Maybe maybe Jimmy, but Nigel wouldn't have stayed on at school. Right. You know. He you know I was supposed to be in the last year of school. There's no way Nigel would have stayed on. Right. Probably not Jimmy. I mean, Nigel probably went away and became a car salesman. Jimmy, <laughs> probably, Jimmy probably went into the city and made a million. Yeah. <laughs> or red tie and did that whole nine yards. But it, it, because that's what was going on at that time. Yeah. <laughs> but he, he wouldn't have stayed on at school. And, and in fairness, even if the characters were the most popular characters in the world, I think they would have been honest enough to accept that those two characters probably wouldn't have stayed on. Right. And, you know, they didn't hold on to people just because of popularity. And proof of that is with Mark. Yeah. And, you know, there had to come a point where Mark wouldn't, I keep saying Mark, I mean Gripper. Right. Um, yeah. Rather than Mark. I should distinguish between <laughs> the two. Um, just, but it, there would have come a point where he would have got expelled from school. Yeah. And they kind of, you know, they made the whole thing so good that they, they, as I said, they, they painted themselves into a corner and left themselves yeah. nowhere. Thankfully for myself and Gary, yeah. we would never have had the chance to have a bit of fun for a year. Um, yeah. If not, cheers, Mark. <laughs> well, I, I, I asked um, Mark Baxter a similar question to this because obviously, you know, he was working with Mark Burgess and Mark Savage. Lee McDonald's was working with Lee Spark. And you were, follow, you know, you were in that position of a, a, a double act having the same first names. Did you? What was? <laughs> how was? How was directing? How you know when you were directed? Did you use your character names or did you use your your, your actor names? I don't remember. <laughs> you know what? I don't remember it ever being a problem. I don't yes. ever remember it being an issue. Um, wow. I don't, that- it's just something. It's just something. Me, 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 and my, you know, my, my warped brain. It's just when, when, when I think about things, I think. I wonder if they just use the character names or or actor. I, names. I mean, generally, um, quite often when people are directing, they'll use your character names, right? Because the the director's thinking in the terms yeah. of the character, not in the actor. Um, so I guess that's what they probably did. I don't ever remember it being something that was. Do you know what? I, 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 obviously, I was aware we both had the same name. <laughs> yeah. I don't ever remember it being a thing. Or, right. a, 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 yeah, that's kind of weird. I, I, <laughs> I've been asked I that that's, that's just me and my war brain uh, wondering on that one. Like, um, okay, so 
uh, your, your time at Grange Hill has finished and you one series wonder uh, for want of a better expression. Oh, I'm so getting that on the <laughs> and you've, One series wonder. You, you, you've mentioned about, you know, the stars of the roller skate disco and you were also in Sorry uh, with uh, Ronnie Corbett. Yeah, with uh, Ronnie Corbett. That was fun. Uh, as well. What like, a funny guy. I can funny imagine. What, what was he like to work with? Ronnie Corbett was one of the funniest people. Like, he, he, I, I, I remember growing up, everyone used to say, oh, the two Ronnies, it's, you know, it's Ronnie Barker's the one, the other guy is not that funny. Yeah, yeah. Ronnie Corbett was just the funniest guy ever. Um, right. Just, he just didn't stop laughing around him. And he was <laughs> so, so nice. Yeah. Uh, you know, most people like I've come across in this business, one way or another, are pretty nice. Yeah. He was so humble. And right. so, we filmed that in front of a, a live studio audience, a part of it in front of a live studio audience. And at the time, I had some friends who were from uh, Canada and Australia uh-huh. in a place where I went to, and they were both working there. And I managed to get them tickets to come and right. see it. Well, right. And he said hello to them. Yeah. You know, he didn't have to, you know, and, but he came out of his way to do it. You know, yeah. he knew they were and he came to say hello. I don't, I'm not even sure if they knew who he was, but probably did. But right. I, I don't know. They were, they were only over for a month or two working uh-huh. it was just nice he was just such a professional and so so good um yeah. and it was, it was a fun show to work on anyway we only did one episode um it was uh, you know i played a bug again <laughs> um, i was always like when i was younger i was always a school bully of a bug or the burglar or the something i don't know yeah um, <laughs> it, was must, just, it was just a lot of you fun you just I mean, have that look <laughs> It was the hair. The hair went. <laughs> um, uh, but he was just, he was just such a funny guy. Like, I'm watching him work. Yeah. I'm watching his mind work and, and just so effortlessly. Uh-huh. I don't think Ronnie Kultwick gets the credit that he deserves uh, for the work yeah. that he's done. I really, really don't. I mean, everybody remembers Ronnie Barker and Ronnie Barker was hysterically funny and wonderful uh-huh. and all the rest of it. And the two Ronnies as a show. I, I look back now and I watch the, the Ronnie Corbett section where he sits in the chair. Yeah. And I, I never really got it when I first saw it. I was maybe yeah. a little too young. Yeah. I watch it now, it's just so clever. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of the stuff that he did was, was clever. And I, 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 I was such a fan after meeting him and working uh-huh. with him and him and, and, I, and kind of finally clicking. It was like, wow, this guy's yeah. so talented. Brilliant. Brilliant. And then um, after that, Possibly, as we say, your most controversial role came up then. Oh, I did something controversial before that. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. I, I, I did another thing with Alan Clark where we all went off and, and trained to be soldiers. Oh, right. Uh, okay. Won a lot of awards. It was a thing called Contact. Right. And it's one of those things that um, it, it's, it's available on Blu-ray. I watched it not that long ago. I managed to pick up a copy and I, uh-huh. I did a trip down memory lane. Uh, and that really was controversial. Right. That, that, uh, the the whole Northern Ireland problem, the border. Oh, that's okay. Trained. You know, we we went away and trained to to be yeah. soldiers. Wow, nice. I, mean, I to this day I could still strip down an SLR and put it back together again. We, we yeah. Went, I mean, it was to that kind of degree. Right, it's okay. And we spent I think like ten weeks in Wales and a couple of weeks in gloucester or something just filming all this stuff on, on super super rare night footage stuff right. uh one of the cameramen from uh, who had been on uh grange hill uh actually was on the show uh, uh-huh. was on, on the filming and, and doing stuff so it, it that was pretty intense yeah um a, a very a, that again was with alan clark who as i say he's known for what his work's always edgy anyway. Yeah. Um, and he's very about creating things that just feel and look real. And I'll never, ever forget, we we spent the first day of actual filming. And bear in mind, we've done lots and lots of training and uh-huh. how to be a soldier. And, yeah. and you get to a stage where, you know, repetition is fact. If you do something over and over and over again, yeah. eventually it's sort of almost instinctive and natural. So we did a scene that we filmed over and over all morning of, of us stopping the car. Right. Um, it was all shot in very documentary style. Um, and, and I knew most of the guys who were working on it. And the car would come down, we'd stop. 
the captain would go over to, to, to somebody would shout gun and someone would shoot the guy in the car. Right. We, we must have rehearsed it 30 times, uh-huh. if not more, over and over. They'd drive this car down. Uh, one of the, uh, and it was a wonderful opening because the soldiers appear from nowhere. We're right. all in the bush, but we're camouflaged. And, and it, it's, it's very clever. And I look back at, you know, what he did and what he created. Uh-huh. And we, we broke for lunch. We came back and Alan Clark, who was directing, said, we're going to do one more rehearsal before we nail this. So I want you to like, give it your best shot. And I want to set everything up. So do we go. So we get ready for one more rehearsal and and you have an element of just, uh, again, you know that when you're doing something for the 50th, 60th time, you know, Uh, which with hindsight now, I know is exactly what he wanted. Yeah. Because he wasn't rehearsing at all. He was filming it. And, and we yeah. were all supposed to be reasonably newish recruits. So when the car stopped and they shouted, gun boss, they fired the gun and there was a blank in there. Not that I knew that. I thought it was the right. real deal. And on the back windscreen of the car, this guy's head exploded. Right. I actually, for a second, I was like, I just completely off. And it was... He'd done it deliberately. He wanted yeah. it to be a shock to us because yeah. it's here where you could read that kind of shot. And, and I think all six or seven of us, whatever it was that were in that particular scene, mm-hmm. all thought something had gone wrong for a second. Right. And because the crew weren't running around like crazy, that you realize, no, it's not. Yeah. He played us. He just played us. And it was just the whole of the filming process was like that. We used to go out, they, they, they'd film it on this weird night vision stuff. Yeah, and we would walk a, a, a through uh, rivers at night as soldiers because that's what they do. Yeah, sort of up to here in water, and there's like no, the light of a sixty watt bulb was pretty much all we had. Miles, <laughs> it was crazy. A lot of fun and, and and a lot of hard work, I guess. Uh-huh. Uh, but it was crazy. It was fun. Yeah, did you did you get used to him um, doing that kind of thing to you though? Like um, you kind of. You knew what you were getting into when you when you sign on with Alan, and, yeah. and I already worked with him on something else. He was very intent. He very much he wanted you to know and understand the character that you were playing, mm-hmm. like literally to what you'd have for breakfast. I mean, yeah. I know that's a stereotype, but he would really do that. And sometimes he would pull you to one side when I was doing Stars and Rollerskate Disco. He'd pull people to one side, myself included, and just chat to you about your character and ask you questions. And he would expect you to know the answer because if you're playing that character, you should know enough to yeah. answer questions as that character. Yeah. And that was a kind of, I guess, a way of him um, understanding whether or not you were getting it, whether yeah. or not you were on the same level, whether or not. Um, and, you know, the, the roller skate one that I did, my character was very isolated and he was in love with the computer screen. Uh, we were in a, 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 a a place where if you were unemployed, <clears throat> which was a big buzz thing in the early 80s, being unemployed, you were taken into this like complex where you spent your life on roller skates, all slept in the same bunks and wherever in this big room. And you had a computer that told you when it was lunch and when it was this and so on right. and so forth. And my character had fallen in love with the woman's voice and an image on the computer. Right. It was a very weird kind of isolated kind of guy. Um, and it was, a, you know, I was 17 or whatever I was, 18. It was a really good opportunity to play something that I hadn't played before. Because yeah. I do you play like the school or, or up until then, I play school bully types and stuff like that. And it, it was fun to do something that was slightly different. And then again, with contact, playing a, a soldier. Yeah. It's Harry and I's careers. You know, he did the Starlight Express on my <laughs> Uh, I did that. I went off and was a soldier in contact. He went off and was a soldier in soldier, soldier. We we mirrored on a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, it was nice to do stuff that was kind of different and rare yeah. and, and stuff that I didn't think that I would get opportunities to do. Uh-huh. Uh, and it was the, the other one that you took. So about. then, so do you want to give us, uh, I don't know what your briefing was for this, for this next part? Because... This, I mean, at the I, time, it was pretty controversial, wasn't it? I, I first, I take it you are talking about EastEnders. I am talking I, about EastEnders, yes. Yeah. So I, I first was, I worked on a schools program 
Right. Um, about a year before EastEnders came out. And I worked with Michelle Collins, Sandy Ratcliffe, who played Sue. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember who else was on it. But there were at least one other EastEnders character or, or subsequent character that went on it. And I'd met Julia uh, Smith and Tony Holland. And they'd kind of muttered thing that they were planning to maybe do or thinking about and da 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 da, da. you know it just I was again 16 17 it was uh -huh. I, I didn't really know what they were talking about but they were really nice and they said you, you'd be good at this or you'd be good at that or whatever when they actually cast it I was off doing the thing in Wales where uh, shooting this army thing so I kind of missed the boat and they originally had me in mind for Mark which uh, they've right. Scar um, Scarborough played yeah. Um, uh, which was great. And, and him and I were also good friends, right. um, you know, on, on the show. And because we used to go to the same clubs. And, and he was also, he was a uh, Glucks or Remington's mate, wasn't he, in Grange Hill? Yeah, he was. Well. <laughs> yes, he was. I'm not going to hold that against him. Um, <laughs> we would hang out outside. We would go. To, the last time I saw Mark, I think, was, oh, no, it was when he came back to East Enders. But other than that, I'd seen him at a club. Not long, you know, maybe six months before he sadly left us. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I then went up for something else. They invited me in for something else and I didn't get it. And I was really surprised that I didn't right. get it. Not because, not in a cocky way, but in a way of like, I kind of, I'd almost been told that I had it. Right. I get you. Yeah, yeah. And I was a bit like, it's kind of weird, but you know, never mind. It doesn't really matter. We'll, we'll just get on right. Yeah. And I, I think with hindsight, and I'll never know this one way or another, but I think Barry was something they'd had it the, in, in the back burner. Right. And I think, you know, because I knew Julia and I knew Tony, uh, and I got called in specifically for the role. Uh, right. And I remember going down to Shepherd's Bush, uh, Union House or Bush House or something, whatever it is down there, and, and reading for it. Um, and when I went in, Julia and Tony, Tony sort of sat me down. And I, I, I was 20 by then. Right. I guess. Um, and they were very serious about it. You know, do, do, do you watch the show? And yes, I'd seen the show a, a bit. I mean, it was very big at the time and people knew what it was. And I knew yeah. people on it as well, you know, like uh, Sue Tully and Peter Dean even. I'd, I'd done some work with before. Right. Um, and we chatted and they said, okay, well, there's this new character called Colin who's in the show. It's not, people are not aware of this yet, but his character is going to be gay. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's all planned and it's all there and it's that's going to happen soon. And we're looking to cast his boyfriend. <laughs> Water for Duck's back. I'm, I'm, I've been working in theatre and television and film since I was 10 or 11. Yeah. It was not something that phased me. I, I, it, you know, it was something that to some degree is just, you know, it's just part of life. I, do, I just, it, it never, ever phased me. I was quite surprised that it phased some people, but it never yeah. really phased me. And I was like, yeah, that's fine, great. And, and I read, and I, uh, I was the first one that they got in on the day, that, like they were casting in the afternoon, they got me in at like two o'clock. I finished reading, um, and they kind of had this serious conversation about, you know, well, you know, would you this, and you'd have to consider the, the controversial, and all of this stuff that was kind of all a bit of a blur, because it's an acting job. Yeah. And, you know, all, all the kind of stuff you're filling me with, it's real, but it's it's not. And they said, would I mind hanging around for a couple of hours and coming back at four o'clock? And I remember kind of thinking that was probably a good thing. Right. That they wanted me to hang around. Uh, and I came back at four o'clock. And um, that was when they had a real serious chat with me about, you know, what the show was and uh, how many people watched it and how much doing a show like EastEnders would change your life. And it was really heavy. I mean, yeah. like really, really heavy. I'm standing there listening to this stuff and thinking, um, you know, and, and they, they sort of said, you know, we would recommend that, you know, before doing anything like this, you talk to your family and da 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 da, da. I mean, it was a proper, real bizarre conversation. Yeah. Uh, I'm sitting there thinking, if I've got this, I'm doing it. I don't give up monkeys about <laughs> this. You know, it's, it's a big yeah. job. And and, and to be fair, I don't think I had any concept of the kind of homophobia and the kind of um, 
grief, for want of a better word, that went on. You know, yeah. I, I, I was, I'm not gay, so I've yeah. not experienced that firsthand or I hadn't up until that point. Right. I'm going to put it that way. Um, and I'd never had an issue with someone being gay. So the whole thing was kind of normalised in my yeah. head to a degree. Um, I, I got offered the role that day, uh, uh-huh. that evening, um, which was amazing and kind of bizarre. Just I, I remember being quite elated. Yeah. And I did dutifully tell my parents and my brother, all, all of which weren't keen at the time. Right. And I'm, like, I'm doing it. It's like, yeah. this isn't even up for debate. It's yeah. Like, you know. Where, where do I sign? Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't until the first. So I was filming for like six or eight weeks before it went out on air. Mm-hmm. And I, I think there'd been one like, there's a guy on, on a, 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 I don't know if LBC is a national radio station or a local radio station, but it was a, a DJ or a voice jockey guy called Steve Allen. Um, there'd been a, 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 a kind of weird thing in the news of the world about me going in to play this character. And, you know, at that point, I'm not supposed to discuss it or any of that sort of stuff. And I wasn't prepared to because, you know, you, you confidentiality agreements and yeah. all that stuff. But I remember Steve Allen, whom I'd never actually met, but we did have mutual friends uh, t- t- talking on air about how ridiculous the news of the world were to, you know, attack this young actor who's just, yeah. you know, whatever. Uh, and we subsequently became great friends yeah. and, and are still good friends now. Um, every day uh, whilst I was filming, I, I used to go out in the morning, get my car, drive up to Boreham Road, Street. And opposite, there were uh, builders in scaffolding, I don't know, paint right. from the house, I don't know, whatever it was. And, you know, it, it, you see people on a regular basis, eventually, you know, oh, morning, all right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That sort of a deal. Uh, and my first episode was shown, and I remember this, I don't know why I remember the date, but I do remember it was November the 18th. No idea why I remember that. Uh, but it went out on November the 18th, and on November the 19th, uh, I went outside, and I didn't get hello. I got hurled abuse. Wow. Just, I, I'm not going to repeat the things that were said, but some of them were really crude. Yeah. And it was, like, and it wasn't really even done in a jokey 80s way because people used to use words then that are not acceptable now. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't, it, you know, some of it was quite, I don't want to say vicious because that makes it sound worse than it is, but it was extreme, I guess. Yeah. It was, and it was a real shock. I was like, uh, and, uh, don't get me wrong, I got skin thicker than an elephant. It, you know, <laughs> it me. I was really quite surprised. Yeah. I didn't expect it. Even though, you know, with hindsight, I'd been warned that this was going to happen. Yeah. And and you did get a lot of that kind of grief because, you know, so I didn't realise in any way, shape or form. And I, I'd, I'd spoken to some friends of mine who were gay and I tried to understand, you know, the issues that being a homosexual would have caused at that time, uh-huh. things that and, and there were things, you know, the things that, you know, there's certain people they wouldn't tell because it would be frowned upon and da 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 da, da so forth and so forth. But, um, I mean, what I did learn was that in London, it's far better than it is in the rest of the country uh, right. at, that, at that point. I can't say uh-huh. what it's like. I don't know about that point. In London was a much freer place, as probably was Manchester and Liverpool and, and big cities, to be quite uh-huh. honest. But, um, you know, if you lived in somewhere like some middle of nowhere village, you know, you didn't tell anyone because right. that's you get a job, you, you know, so on and so forth. And it just, the whole thing, Michael was was great to work with, you know, very, uh, you know, very open, very honest actor. Who's uh-huh. Very helpful. Um, um, you know, had no problems with me asking questions. Uh, uh-huh. Sometimes you don't understand things. And I, I got misquoted once. Uh, in a newspaper with with the way he he tried to explain stuff with me and they did it deliberately and it was yeah. upset, which was a shame but the truth of it was he he said to for me to that a, a relationship between two men is just the same as a relationship between me and my then girlfriend it's all yeah. about love um and when he said that it just nailed it 
I, I just yeah. really, and it yeah. just and I know it's obvious, but sometimes you need someone to spell it out for you just to make it to simplify it. Yeah. And it just made sense. Uh and we became great friends, apart from anything else. Uh I think um I was a little sad in some ways that uh, there was a thing at the time called Clause 28, um, yeah. which was uh, this government, uh, it's a whole load of BS, but <laughs> basically organisations such as the BBC, such as schools and colleges, and et cetera, et cetera, couldn't be seen to promote homosexuality. Right. So the, it, it was just complete nonsense. Yeah. Um, but it did have a negative effect on what the BBC could do with Colin and Barrett. Yeah. Um, because, I, you know, their hands are somewhat tied. It's a public broadcasting thing, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, and I, I'm sure many people say, no, 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 we never changed a thing. Yeah, they did. They yeah. absolutely did. We filmed some scenes um, to this day that I, I've never seen. We right. filmed them. I've never actually seen them. Um, uh, Gary Webster was in them and played my bro- brother in EastEnders who later went on to be uh, in Minder yeah. with um, George Carl. Yeah. Um, and it was the scene where the wonderful thing was Gary's character in EastEnders was very supportive of his little brother. I was mm-hmm. a little brother and he was very supportive. But our dad wasn't. And right. I had to come out to our dad who was played by an amazing actor. I can't remember his name. I feel awful. Um, it was a long time ago and I'm old, um, but he was great. And he, he gave such an amazing performance, this guy. And it was such an amazing scene. It was so well written, everything about it. It, it. it was so honest about the idea of this working class boy yeah. coming out to his dad and saying, you know what, I'm gay. I actually like guys. And yeah. the reaction was, was, I mean, it was scary. I'm real. Uh, and because of Close 28 and because of other stuff, they, they they didn't bother using it. They replaced it with a scene shot in the middle of the square with Barry sitting there looking uh, upset and Colin coming along saying, what's wrong? And he said, yeah, I told my dad he wasn't pleased. But he didn't actually show the actual scene? No, the scene was oh, cut. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, l- mm. Lost. I don't know if it still exists. Probably not. Um, and... <sighs> I suddenly... I mean, I'd been beaten up quite badly. Uh, for playing the role, right, and I just get abuse all the time. Ironically, Michael never ever did. I think that's <laughs> um, I, I was, you know, still young enough that I was going to clubs, and, and and I guess, you know, that's I, I, I guess in some way you attract that when you're that age, and, and maybe right. not for offence, Michael. Uh, <laughs> you know, I remember him telling me he got off train once, um, and all the Millwall supporters got off, and. He said he was a little kind of edgy at first, not sure, until they all started singing We Love You, Colin. I'm like, that never happened to me, not once, ever. No. You know, it, got in, it was grief. It was always, like, abuse. Uh, and I don't know why that is. It was because I was younger. Right. Um, but it, it's just, you know, I got beaten up really badly. A uh, guy attacked me in a car. You know, it, it was pretty serious stuff. Yeah. And, the the experience was not a pleasant one and I came very close to hurting him actually right. in defense quite seriously. And it was only the, the intervention of someone who was there that stopped that. Uh, um, because if you get into a situation where you're you, you consider whether it is or it isn't, but whether you think your life is being threatened uh-huh. to that and, and seriously being threatened. Yeah. Things click over and you, yeah. you're not quite as rational as you were. Yeah. Uh, and and it was pretty scary. Um, um you know, whatever. It's done fantastic. And it, all all experiences that you come through are good because you learn from them one way or the other. Uh the guy ended up losing his job and all sorts of yes. stuff. I think you know it's crazy. I had journalists sleeping on my doorstep. I remember once to get out of the wow. house, uh we lived in um terraced houses in in Archway in North London. That's where I grew up. And I remember we knew the neighbours. That's how long the car it was. Everyone knew <laughs> I remember climbing over like five or six garden walls to come out of a house, you know, five or six doors down 
And a girlfriend at the time was waiting for me in a car so I could kind of, and we, we made sure the car was facing the way different to where their car was facing. Right. At the time they turned around, they were never going to catch up. Yeah. And it's like, I look back at it now and it seems sort of surreal. Yeah, they do, yeah. Interested or, or, or whatever, but they wanted to get photos because I, I, you know, the guy hurt my eye quite badly. Uh, there's actually a, a scene, I guess I can talk about this now, don't see why not. There's a scene where he's queuing up for a, a record fair or a jumble sale or something in the square. And it's in the middle of summer. And nobody ever questioned why he's wearing a hat, sunglasses, and a big scarf. <laughs> and it's because, you know, I, you know, I, my eye was all messed up. Yeah. And my neck was really swollen because he tried to strangle me, this guy. Right. Um, and it, it's like, I look back now and it's, it's funny now. You know, now I can laugh about it now. Yeah, yeah. That was the kind of attitude of people at that time yeah you know let's take me out of the equation completely because you know it, it, i'm fine or whatever but there were people that were facing that mm -hmm. daily weekly and probably still are to be yeah. quite frank you know there's still kind of people are still kind of a bit funky about stuff um less so now i guess but still a little bit but at that time you know you had people still really seriously getting beaten up. Yeah. yeah. You had all of this stuff going on. And it was like, I, you know, I had the other extreme in, you know, we filmed in Elstree. And I've told the story before. It's, it's not the first time I've told it. It's not an exclusive, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> people got used to seeing people from EastEnders in Elstree because they were there every day. So. Yeah. You, didn't, you, you know, you could go around the local supermarket there and nobody would really take a lot of notes of you. It was easy to drop in. So one day I went in there. And I, I, I don't know, went in there some, something minor. I, who knows? Uh, and I had an old woman chasing me with a French stick telling me to leave Colin alone. Wow. Hysterical. And I'm, I had to leave the store. I just no choice. So it went from one to the other. And I also used to get, and still do get, and it's, but you know, I'm on Twitter and I don't really do Facebook. I don't like right. Facebook. Um, but I do Twitter, which is kind of fun. Uh, but I still get messages from people and still get letters through my agent coming through from people saying, you know what? You were part of the reason I was able to come out. Right. Or you're responsible for this. You're responsible for that. And, you know, at the time, I don't think I appreciated the effect that we might have. Yeah. I, you know, much of that is is probably more to do with Michael than it is to me. Right. Because I didn't really understand. And I, I'll be really honest, I was a, probably a little naive, you know, in my yeah. early 20s. You know, having some fun and, and doing a job that I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and but when I look back and when I read some of these things that people say, I mean, I, it was uh, something on Twitter recently with a headline went up about something from years ago. And some of the comments, the, the really amazingly warm comments. Yeah. And sincere comments saying, listen, that was really important in my life. Yeah. One of my very, very good friends who incidentally just visited a couple of weekends ago, you know, before we met um, and became friends. Mm -hmm. um, he, he says the same thing. He said, you know, that being on TV meant yeah. that he could talk about it to his mum. Yeah. And and that eventually he could bring it around to him. Yeah, I mean but, that, that that must be amazing, wasn't it? To to have to have had that impact. Yeah. I just wish I could be. I wish I could say well, I did that deliberately. Yeah, I did <laughs> part of it that just went with it, and 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 it, it, you know, it was Julia, it was Tony, it was the production team, it was all of those other people that actually did it. And people say, "Oh, you must have been so brave." Do you know, what? You, you can only be brave if you think there's if you think there's a risk or if you think there's a problem. Yeah, I was naive. I never even considered there'd be a problem or a risk yeah. or any of it. And for the most part, there wasn't. For the most part, it was a lot of fun. I yeah. was there for a couple of years or so, and I met some really nice people. I had some really good times, and it, it the fact that it has had such a lasting impact for uh -huh. some um, is is a bonus. Yeah. And and a privilege, you know, it's nice to be able to say, yeah, I was involved in that. I, I was part of that. Uh, yeah. Albeit, 
you know, without knowing in some degrees. And, you know, I'm not trying to be overly humble, but, I, you know, I was early yeah. 20s, I really appreciate the seriousness. of, And I think I grew to understand the seriousness of it the longer I was in the show because you see more and more stuff, you read more and more stuff, mm-hmm. and you understand more and more. Yeah. But I think Barry kind of came to came of age throughout the time I played it, and probably so did I as a right. person because it gave me a greater understanding of other yeah. things. Um, and it, at a time when you are going through those, you know, you, you're getting older, you're starting to see uh-huh. things and do things differently. Um, so it was, it was a really, it was controversial on it, but it was a lot of, a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. It's funny, I was with Peter Dean um, just last week, unfortunately, at the funeral I, I spoke to you about. Uh-huh. Uh, we were just chatting about some stuff. And it, it, it's funny, I, I catch up with Peter. We live not so far away from each other. and We've got some mutual friends as well. Uh-huh. Uh, in fact, one of his mutual friends is one of my neighbours, bizarrely. Um, <laughs> uh and it, it's funny, you know, when you look back at, at then, it's a, it's a very different show now. And it's a very successful show. I'm not saying it's better, worse, or indifferent. It's just different. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it's funny. We were on twice a week and a repeat on Sunday. Uh, but we only had four channels. Yeah. It wasn't the So, yeah, we did a massively high viewing figures. Yeah. It's four. Um, you know, EastEnders now, people say, oh, the few figures have dropped and they're terrible and then there's that and the other. Yeah, it's not quite true because people are watching it on catch-up and they're yeah. watching it on this. I don't know where those figures, how they add the, all that stuff up. Mm-hmm. You know, I, it, I'm, I'm really proud that I did EastEnders. I'm really proud that I did Grange Hill as well. Uh-huh. Actually, generally, I did, 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 did the big highlights. But yeah. The show I watched and enjoyed before I did them. So, yeah. you know, from that point of view, I'm really proud of them. And I'm, I'm proud of most of what I've done, to be honest. There's not a lot. Of, you know, a couple of things I've done that have not been that great. You know, anyone who's heard my record will back, back you up. <laughs> uh, but I've been very, very lucky yeah. in some things I've had a chance to do. Uh, and I've got involved and met some really, really nice people, had some really, really good times. And I have some great memories from those yeah. times. And I'm working now, not as much as I'd like. I still work. I still get out there and do it. Um, Brilliant. Still doing things. Uh, you know, be they little fringe plays or plays or or whatever. And I, I just get yeah. on with it because I'm acting. Uh, yeah. And that's really what it boils down to. I love acting. Brilliant. Are you still in touch with anyone from Green Jill? Uh, I, I speak to Lee periodically. Um, who else? There must be someone else. <laughs> Uh, probably only Lee. I don't want to guess. put names in your mouth here, so I won't say it. <laughs> I, I, I like big friend of Terry C. Pat. I see Terry right. a bit. Uh, and that was devastating. Yeah. Uh, occasionally I see Mark Monero. All right. Yeah. I remember Mark. Um, who else do I see? I don't see, you know, I'm, I don't see anybody really regularly. Yeah. Know that, and, and I, I feel that there are certain people that if I needed to, and I wanted to pick the phone up, and said, "Look, I'm, I need a, something. Can you yeah. and we have a drink?" And vice versa. Yeah, you know that they would reach out. I've not seen Gary in like forever. Right. Uh, but you know, sorry, I'm sure you know we would have a lot in common, and we'd just buzz back to you know yeah. whatever. Um, it's it's a funny business because you're forever. You're like very transient business. You're always moving on to the next job and the yeah. next group of people and the next, and and all of those groups, you know, when people look at, you know, oh, you're an actor, what have you been in? Nobody ever really remembers anything unless it was on television or film. Yeah. Because that's what it is. And then it has to be something that's quite big because I've done lots and lots of television that people have never, ever seen and maybe not likely to see. But they'll remember the big things like Grinchy and that. But there are all those other casts that I've worked with uh-huh. along the way that... I also became friends with, and you have this huge circle of people that you've worked with. And the older you get, the bigger that circle gets. And I did a play uh, just before lockdown, um, written by uh, a, a wonderful actress called Annie Birkin, called Wines and Spirits. And I'm desperately trying to get her to do it again. <laughs> it, did it as part of the Camden Fringe. Um, and I, I'd been involved in the reading. She'd written it and she asked me to come along and do the reading. And I, I literally said to her at the end of the reading, if you don't cast me, you and I may fall out. 
because I was yeah. just that <laughs> it was a gay character interesting enough but that that was kind of important or not but I, and it was just such a wonderful piece mm-hmm. it was um it was like just a little over 90 minutes or just a little under 90 minutes um and we played it at the hen and chickens in Highbury corner in, Is- in islington yeah. uh, it ran for like 10 days as part of the fringe i think all but the first night it was sold out right uh, and the first night word got around real quick it, it, and i i think everybody in it was stunning uh it but it was so well written yeah and the character that i played um which is why i enjoyed it so much was was very much all the way through it and also ran you didn't realize the importance of this character until the end and every night and it, it still gives me a buzz and goosebumps now but every night at the end of the play as the reveal happened and as you saw this, whatever, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, I would hear, <gasps> wow, from after, and it was amazing. It was such a buzz. And yeah. two good friends of mine, um, Steve and Lee, who are you know both big metal guys, and they, you know, <laughs> really, I made them, you know, they're real kind of tough guys with the long hair and the beards, and the, you know, um, yeah. tattoos, and the, you know, they go. <laughs> Uh, who go out, you know, drinking crazy beers and concerts and festivals and all that. Both came out and had a go at me because I made them cry. Yes. <laughs> and not only did I make them cry, they have spoken about it on here and I will make sure they get a link to this. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. So, I mean, you've said there, you know, you know about, you know, maybe you've not been on uh, telly and, and whatever too much. There's one thing I need to talk to you about. 2015, Star Wars, The Force Awakens. Oh, what can I tell you, dude? Right. Is it true that you played a stormtrooper in The Force Awakens? 100%. Absolutely. 100%. I am a massive comic book, Star Wars, sci-fi geek. I mean, look, it's going to move that. that. That's my living room wall. Right. So that's a big, massive picture of Batman there. On the yeah, wall, <laughs> it, it covers the whole of my living room. Um, I, I, I run an organization called um, the UK Garrison. Okay. Uh, if you're interested in knowing what that is, and I'd love you to have a look at it, go on YouTube. There's a thing called Heroes of the Empire. Okay. We are a bunch of uber geeks, uh, nerds, call us what you want, but it's basically a good bunch of people that go out and raise a lot. It's our 22nd birthday today, funny enough. All oh, right, so happy uh, birthday. <laughs> I've, I've been running it for about 13 of so years, I think, something like that. Um, we, we raise a lot of money for charity. We do hospital visits. My, my Christmas morning starts with me getting in my car, driving up to Milton Keynes, which is about 60, 70 miles away, right. and spending the morning at the children's ward. Going oh, there and dressed up as a character from either, either Batman or Star Wars or yeah. something, and going and handing out presents to them. And it's, it's amazing. Oh, it's such a lot yeah. of fun. As a result of doing all this stuff, because um, we do a lot of work with Lucasfilm and Disney uh, because of what we do is, is, is very high end. The, the suits and stuff are, are very accurate. And we're all actually going to be at a thing called Megacom this weekend in Birmingham. So we're right. doing some stuff up there. So anyone who, I don't know if this goes out before the weekend or when it is, but if you were at Megacom, I hope we ran into each other and I hope came over to the high. If you're going to be at Megacom, likewise, come and say hello and, and we can chat. Uh, but we're up there. We, we raise about 50 grand a year for charity. Right. People take and we help other charities raise stuff. And we have a great time. And, and through that, Lucasfilm kind of wanted to, Lucasfilm Disney wanted to pay us back a little bit somehow. And um, they cast six of us right. um, to be stormtroopers in, in The Force Awakens. And uh, I was like a two-year-old. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I saw Star Wars when... Uh, when I was 11, when it first came out. In 19, I saw it in 77. Uh, it came out at Christmas, 77 over here, and I saw it as a Christmas present. So I saw it right. just, just as it came out. And I, I was blown away from it. It was the perfect age, right? 11 to watch Star Wars. It was absolutely perfect. And I've been kind of obsessed with it ever since, one way or another. And I've got uh-huh. toys and this and that and all that kind of nerdy, geeky stuff. I love all that. Um, and watch the film. It's called Heroes of the Empire. And you'll see a side of me that <laughs> is different, I guess. <laughs> uh, oh, brilliant. 
No, that's because well, I saw that. I saw well, that on well. IMDb and it was said uncredited. And I thought, no, I'm not having that. What's, what's the line that she's like, aren't you a little short to be a stormtrooper? I am actually <laughs> not a little short to be a stormtrooper because I was. I was. <laughs> and that is, that's 100% true. And what was really bizarre about it was they used us to do the premiere. So they right. characters in Leicester Square to turn up and do the premiere. And at that point, I was still under an NDA and couldn't tell anyone that we were oh, actually. Wow. Um, and it was it was a really mixed time because both around that time when the film came out, my my dad was very very ill. So was subsequently, sadly, passed away not long after, and then my mum passed up and shortly after that. So it was a really weird, funky time in my life. Uh-huh. Um, but it was it, I don't know. It, 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 we we did the premiere, and I'm like, I can't say. There were six of us who yeah. did it. We were all there, and none of us could say. Oh. Um, but it was a lot of fun. So yeah, I did. I did get to do that. I was up at Pinewood. Uh, we got there at silly o'clock in the morning, and we were filming till uh, eight, nine o'clock at night or something. And we didn't get out of the uniform with the armor, <laughs> and you didn't need to go to the toilet because it was so hot. You were just sweating, really? <laughs> like you know. We probably all lost a stone that day yeah. just in sweat. It was crazy, oh, uh, but it was such a lot of fun. Yeah. And, to say, well, yeah, actually, I was in Star Wars is, is pretty much. I wanted to be in Great Joe. I wanted to be in EastEnders. I wanted to be in Star Wars. I don't <laughs> want to cast me as Doctor Who and Batman. My life is just complete, seriously. Hey, there's talk of a new Doctor Who, isn't there? There's talk at the I, moment. I'm perfect. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I think Doctor Who is, is such a great show. I've always thought it was a great show, and I love it. I remember when... When I used to do uh, EastEnders, I always used to get asked what would I like to do, and it was always I'd love to play Doctor Who. Brilliant. Because it, it's one of those things that there's no boundaries. Yeah. You can make that character. That, you know, Tom Baker was the greatest example of that. Yeah. You know, this kind of eccentric, time-traveling kind of, you know, it, it's, just, it, it's just so open to having some fun with and creating a doctor that's a little bit yeah they're know, always different aren't they i mean i'm not a doctor yeah. who fan but i know obviously like you know they're always different aren't they you know every single one I, of them. i've not seen so much of it i mean i'm a big fan of it from when i was a kid growing yeah. up doctor who is such a big thing and again that goes back to it's three channels uh, yeah. you know there was you know bc1 bc2 and itv and that was it yeah um, and Doctor Who was a regular thing, you know. There was the Pink Panther cartoon and Doctor Who, both on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, those are things that I really remember. Um, oh no, that's a... I'm a psychiatrist. I'm talking about things I haven't spoken about in years. <laughs> well, I'll, 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 I'll send you my fee later on. Don't worry yeah. about that. That's that's cool. I won't pay that one either. <laughs> All right, then. So I've just got a, a, a few more questions just to ask no, you. No, yeah, you know, we're having fun. Cool. They're all about Grange Hill. Uh, these, okay. These, these few questions. like So, uh, obviously, because you've said you were a fan. So, other than Nigel Flavin, who was your favourite character on the show? I Gripper. Right. Yeah, Gripper. And, and, and not because I knew him. Because I knew him after he was Gripper. Um, I, uh, but Gripper was... I, I thought Gripper just... I don't think there was... I don't think there was a bad character in Grand Chill. Uh-huh. I don't think there was anyone that was um, uh, not good at what they do. I don't think there was a bad character in the show. I think they were all well thought of and, 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 and you know, all very well-rounded. But yeah. Gripple was just such, had such an impact. Uh-huh. And, yeah, if I had a favourite character, I'd, I think Gripper. Brilliant, um, brilliant. And if you couldn't have played Nigel, who, who would you have liked to have played? Would it have been Gripper? Oh, God. Uh, you know what? I don't know. No, I, it wouldn't have been Gripper because I don't know that I'd have done anything better or different than Mark. I think right. Mark now. And, and if you were going to do something, then it should be something that you think you could do different. Uh, yeah. And, uh, it's a really difficult question. Um, I'd love to have gone back as a teacher. That would have been kind of fun. <laughs> um, well, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 I've never ever considered. <laughs> um, oh, man, nobody's ever asked me a question that I can't answer. <laughs> I, I, I actually, I just don't know. I, I won. Have I won the interview? Have I won? <laughs> yeah, 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 by definite, yes. absolutely. 
Yeah, I, I absolutely can't think of it who else I would have been. You know, yeah. Okay. No, that that that's fair enough. No, everyone always seems to say, you know, that 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 is a difficult question. Like, yeah, it's really difficult. Oh, yeah. And I've never asked that ever, <laughs> ever, ever. All right. My last official question then is, wh- why do you think that there is still such affection for Grange Hill? What, you know, wh- why do you think we're still forty years on, we're still talking about it? Because it was good. Phil yeah. Redmond, what he was doing when he created the show, um, they cast. The show really well. Uh-huh. Um, the writers, they didn't, you know, they used good writers yeah. for the show and good directors. And the, the BBC took it seriously. They knew they had something special. They didn't cut corners with it. Um, and I think we're still talking about it because, I, you know, as cheesy as it sounds, I do remember running home from school to watch it. Yeah. Because it was good. I, and you look forward to it. You know, the, there are very few shows in my life that, I can actually say, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I would run home to, to see that or I would not go out because that was on. Um, you know, and, and people didn't have videos then. So, you know, when Grunge Hill first came out, if you didn't see it, you didn't see it. That's it. Yeah. Um, until, you know, now when you can buy most of them on Blu-ray or whatever. Yeah. That was what you do. Uh, yeah, I just think it was a good show. Uh-huh. It was very honest. It was new. Nothing, there hadn't been anything like Grange Hill until Grange Hill. It was the closest thing that you got to what you can look back at now and say was a kid's soap. Yeah. Because it dealt with issues in the way that soaps dealt with issues. It was set in a kind of really in a, a, a single place, you know, i.e. in school, although it all, you know, the, the school was the yeah. sun and everything satellited around it. But it was... And I, I think ultimately the BBC took it seriously and, and, and never kind of just cut corners, um, you know, which is so often when something's good, people start to cut the budget and rely on the fact that it's good. So we, we don't need to do this bit because people are going to watch it anyway. They never did. They, they upped the game uh, so many times with that show yeah. and kept it. I think the wonderful thing about Grand Show, and you can compare it to Doctor Who, is everybody has their cast yeah. because they're the cast that you grew up with at yeah. that point in your life that you yeah. identify that were like you and then were like, you know, I, I guess if effectively my cast would have been Tucker because I saw it in, when it first came out and I was just uh-huh. long in secondary school and there were a lot of things that, you know, reflected what was going on in my life and, and, and my school experiences. Right. You know, they were not as extreme, but they couldn't be because it was BBC and it was on at five o'clock or whatever. Uh-huh. Well, um, and I, I, I think honestly, we're still talking about Dad's Army because it was good. It was yeah. funny. We're still talking about all these other shows, Moonlight, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. The reason they survived is because they're good, and Cream always rises to the top. Yeah. And and the thing is, you forget just how many shows we don't talk about because you know they were okay at the time, but they weren't good. They weren't real classics. And Grand Chill is. It's a classic, absolute classic. Yeah, and it must be, as an actor, it must be really, you know, really good to have been part of that. I was brilliant. I mean, you know, I look back and think, you know, in the 80s, I was involved in two of the biggest shows on TV. Yeah. Um, and you know, to be involved in one is pretty impressive. To be involved yeah. in two, Jesus, I, you know, I, I'm so lucky. And I really do appreciate that. I don't... Yeah. I don't take any of that for granted, you know. And regardless, if you know, I, <laughs> I've been very lucky in that I've got to do some shows that I wanted to do mm-hmm. and that I've been fans of. Um, most recently, um, I don't know how much time you've got. I'm taking about an awful lot of your time. Oh, most recently, right. I hooked up with, by accident, I bumped into the guy who writes the show Luther right. a few years ago, and we got talking and he, he kind of knew my work, and I was like a gushing kid over Luther. I loved the show. Yeah. Um, and he said, well, you know, give me a card, and maybe I'll get in touch. Uh, they then shot season four. He never reached out. I was like, oh, well, never mind. That's the yeah. way it goes. Season five, I got a phone call just before Christmas. Right. And, then it. Um, and he had, I discovered luckily that he had insisted that they get me in to read for a certain role which he didn't insist that I do the role, but he got he insisted that I read for the role. And I subsequently uh-huh. found out that um, 
you know, I got the role because somehow or another I, I seemed to fit it better than anyone else. And I ended up doing three episodes or four episodes of Luther. Again, same as East Enders, same as Green Check. It was a show that I loved and really wanted yeah. to be part of. And I got that chance. And, you know, to be that lucky and do that much stuff, you know, yeah. people don't get a chance to do one thing like that. I've, I've, yeah. I've done so much cool stuff. I've been involved in, in so much good stuff. Yeah. I, don't know. I, I really do think I'm I'm very 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 lucky. No, no, definitely, definitely. Um, cool. No, that's. I mean, that's. Uh, uh, it's been great, Gary. Honestly, I've I've got to thank you so much for coming on and, I'm really and talking to you. I'm, I'm I'm going to be completely honest with the fact that you've only been on for for one series of Grain Jill. I did wonder what we were going to talk about. I'll be completely honest. Honestly, mate, it's it's it, it's been it's been brilliant. And as you said, you know, you were there on Grain Jill. You were there EastEnders in the infancy and all that. And 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 as I've said, you don't think anything of it. But obviously, it was a it was a pretty ballsy thing to have gay characters on yeah. on EastEnders. I, I mean, time, I can see like, that now, but. Yeah, but honestly, it's been it's been it's been brilliant talking to you, um, and I can tell everyone now that I've, I've you know I've had a conversation with a stormtrooper as well. So um, <laughs> so I, I I love it as well. So honestly, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, it's, it's been a, uh, honestly, it's been a real pleasure. I, yeah. I've actually enjoyed just catching up, and it's been very relaxed just chatting to you like we you know known each other for thirty yeah. four years. No, yeah, brilliant. Casual, well, th- thank you for that as well. So, yeah, as I say, thanks for coming on. And for anyone who's listening, thank you very much. And I'll speak to you next time. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Neil.